So thank you so much for uh, staying uh, till the end. Uh, it's been a very long day. Uh, but I think actually uh, it's going to be an interesting session. I will spend maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, recapping some of the themes we've addressed so far. And that's going to guide our discussion, uh, be a framework uh, to, uh, to really uh, look at our 2018 goals and beyond. And uh, at the end, I'd love to get some feedback. And uh, Kaylee has graciously agreed to, uh, to take notes uh, to, uh, to document the discussion. So I'm an um, uh, ALD patient uh, based in Palo Alto, California. I've been on the board of uh, ALD Connect since uh, inception. And um, I'm uh, very happy, very impressed with this meeting, uh, the turnout, the content, uh, the energy, and uh, just the, the wonderful uh, individuals uh, who are here today. So it's absolutely wonderful. Tomorrow I will share, uh, tomorrow morning I will share a, a more personal story in terms of my patient journey, what I've experienced, and uh, where I'm at, you know, uh, health-wise. So next slide. So basically in preparation for this, uh, this talk, I looked at um, what some of our uh, sister organizations are doing, uh, some rare disease foundations, and uh, try to uh, outline what some of our 2018 goals uh, could be. So I think we heard today a lot about uh, patient education and, and education um, uh, beyond the patient. And I think we are all in this together, which is to drum up awareness and support for this disease. And that means um, you know, doing what I would call high touch volume education for patients, uh, patients who just got diagnosed, uh, who don't have immediate access to, uh, you know, very, very uh, personalized uh, healthcare, and uh, as well drumming up awareness and support of this disease among uh, physicians, uh, pediatricians, neurologists who very often do not know this disease very well, uh, nurses, and school districts so that when they observe a certain pattern of behavior, they at least have an inkling that you know, this could be caused by, by this disease. And so we do it with collateral, with content, uh, with data sheets, with briefs uh, that are on our website and also get um, distributed in the field uh, as, as broadly as possible. Um, we need to continue uh, with our new website, which we're hoping to, uh, to launch very soon to have very fresh, uh, very appealing content on this disease and its many aspects. So the genetics, the inheritance pattern, um, the pathology, how different the pathology is for different patients at different ages or with different phenotypes. Um, some of the symptoms and how they can be uh, alleviated and, and managed. Uh, and so I think, you know, for someone like me, uh, being 51, uh, having lived with this disease almost uh, uh, 10 years now, uh, I, I'm really in kind of the disease management mode is, you know, living in the day to day, taking one step at a time and managing my symptoms as, as they come up. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then, you know, one thing, uh, one organization that I'm, I'm very familiar with is uh, the European, European Leukodystrophy Association, ILA, uh, in, uh, based in, uh, in France. Uh, you probably wonder why I know them. <laughs> and um, their annual meeting is uh, every year in Paris, uh, typically at the end of March, last weekend in March or first weekend in April. Uh, it attracts anywhere between 300 to 450 people and from all over Europe and, and beyond. And ILA is a big organization. They have a, roughly a $5 million annual budget and they spent about 90% of it on family support. And that means you know, local meetups uh, in small towns, uh, little fundraisers for uh, small businesses, you know, a lot of grassroots activism and, of course, a lot of toolkits uh, to equip the membership uh, with 
the ability to raise money, to raise awareness at the local level. And then they, of course, go in depth into you know, uh, house retrofits, assistive devices, uh, essentially continued care, as well as uh, reimbursement, uh, financial planning, and so on. And then, um, you know, one publication that I love, that I, uh, I get in both uh, print and electronically, and I recommend to patients is Neurology Now, uh, which is the, uh, the publication from the American Academy of Neurology targeted at patients. Uh, and it, is, uh, it hits, I think, a wonderful tone, which is it's never condescending or paternalistic to patients, uh, but it's also uh, not you know, arcane and, uh, and opaque. It's, uh, it's written in a very uh, understandable, very engaging way. And um, you know, I read it, uh, I read it uh, from, from, uh, from cover to cover uh, anytime I receive it. And uh, you know, I'm reading these articles about MS and ALS and Parkinson's and, uh, and uh, Bat Batten and Duchenne. And I'm thinking you know, a lot of those uh, learnings apply to me and, and to ALD as well. And then, um, you know, one idea uh, recently that um, I think a lot of us have brainstormed is also, I know in our community, you know, I'm, I'm on the social media sites, um, I think we have a lot of exciting candidate therapies uh, being worked on, but the reality today is we don't have anything. You know, we don't have anything that's been approved, uh, that's been uh, brought to market, that is at the bedside. And um, a lot of us are trying things. You know, we're trying supplements, uh, we're trying, um, we're trying a, a bunch of different things. A lot of men uh, in, in our community uh, to deal with pain uh, use, um, use cannabis. Uh, people use all kinds of things. You know, they try them because short of, uh, you know, very high toxicity, we want to try things and see if, you know, there is a small chance they, they could work. So I think it would be wonderful to have a sort of clearing house uh, as is the case in the, uh, the ALS community uh, with ALS and Tangled, where there is an objective way to assess a lot of these alternative therapies and uh, see if they uh, have any kind of scientific uh, basis, um, get clear evidence to see if they have worked, and if they have worked, as many of them do, try to understand you know, why they worked and if it, if it can be reproduced if it can be replicated. So these are, are definitely, I would say, outward facing goals uh, towards the, the whole community. Next slide, please. Okay, so at the end of the day, we are a, uh, we are a, a catalyst, we are a vehicle, we're a platform for clinical trial readiness. So we are kind of the federator that a lot of these, these uh, industry partners like uh, Minorix, Norovia, Vertex, Biogen, Bluebird, and others will come to and say, you know, we want to uh, look at the feasibility of a therapy for ALD. Uh, you know, tell us more about the community, tell us more about the data, tell us more about the motivation, tell us more about, you know, sites uh, where we could actually deliver uh, these studies. So that's who we are as ALD Connect. And so um, one thing is we, uh, we want to continue uh, qualifying and, and recruiting and qualifying uh, sites, uh, centers of excellence, and, and find the right synergy with GLIA uh, to do that. Again, you know, a lot of the country uh, today is uh, you know, doesn't have a good center of excellence within a 500 mile radius. That's wrong and that needs to be corrected. Um, we need to do fundraising for the disease. You know, should we think about a sort of next ice bucket challenge? And that was, a, of course, an extraordinary uh, event. And, um, you know, interestingly, it had, uh, it was a, a miraculous event. You know, I think that took the, um, the uh, funding for ALS from a few million dollars annually to a spike of more than a hundred million dollars 
in one year. And of course, you know, that has completely uh, tapered off uh, as the excitement of the social media campaign has died down. But the reality is that it, it, it has funded a ton of projects. My 23-year-old uh, my son uh, is doing research on ALS. And when I asked him why, he said, Pops, obviously, it's because of the ice bucket challenge. My lab got a grant. You know, that would not have been the case uh, without the challenge. Um, we continue to be the, probably the best vehicle to apply for uh, uh, research funding from the likes of uh, the Neurological Institute for uh, the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke, NINDS, uh, and, and other federal agencies. You know, we have the, the uh, kind of the, the ecosystem of industry, academia, uh, patients uh, to make a, a, a very strong appeal uh, for federal funding. And then we need to continue uh, strengthening and, uh, and, and, and uh, keeping uh, our infrastructure up to date. And I think uh, we heard today a lot about the need for uh, a strong registry uh, so that we know who the patients are, uh, where they are, uh, what is their condition, and of course, uh, how have they uh, evolved over time, and, and try to profile them for enrollment in uh, clinical studies. And um, we need to continue to scout for therapies. Um, so one of my, my, um, uh, my pet causes is, I know there are probably about 50 small biotechs uh, right now working on a molecule uh, that could be the molecule that cures ALD. And, um, and, and the reality is we need to, to uh, proactively uh, search for these biotech companies because they may have heard of, AL of ALD, but they are, they're not uh, putting ALD today in their, uh, their the, the six or eight or 10 indications they would like to try their molecule on first. And so, and you know, when we get in touch with them at um, uh, medical conferences like uh, JP Morgan or Bio Investor Forum, they always have the same question, which is, you know, is there something against the LD today? Is the patient community organized? Are they are they hungry? Um, you know, how much risk are they willing to take? Uh, they, these companies want to understand more about the pathology of the disease. And they want to know whether uh, they are specialists, you know, um, uh, people like Keith Van Heeren, uh, Ali Fatemi, and Florian Eichler, who can uh, roll out uh, a human study. So we need to continue to uh, prospect uh, for these, these companies and these compounds. Next slide, please. And then advocacy and uh, bridge building. So advocacy, um, I think, is both at an organizational level as well as an as a individual level. And we heard you know, a lot today, uh, the wonderful example of uh, Gene Kelly and, and others, and of course, um, uh, the group, the, the wonderful team that lobbied uh, relentlessly for uh, the uh, inclusion of ALD in the newborn screening panel at the federal level, at the federal, for the federal recommendation, and then uh, for the states. And I think, you know, um, I know my challenge is uh, the disease is part of me. I don't want to, to become the disease. I, I don't want Ben to be just about ALD. So I want to remain a very, you know, uh, fun person to be with. But I also, I don't, I want to never waste an opportunity to, uh, to advocate for the disease. And, um, and that's a onus at, you know, at the personal level. And the thing I hear most often when I talk to fellow patients, they say, well, you know, I'm not an MD and I'm not a billionaire, so I don't know what I can do. And I don't have any billionaire friends. But the reality is that we all have skills. We all have networks. And I think we have to find these opportunities to, to advocate. I think that's the big lesson of today. So a fun example uh, happened to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. One of the things I do on the side is I, I mentor 20-somethings uh, on career transitions. 
And so I was mentoring this 28-year-old uh, woman. And uh, one day, I got a call from her mom uh, who said, you know, I understand you've been mentoring my daughter. Uh, you're making a big difference in her life. And I'm, I'm really grateful. How can I ever repay you? And I, at first, I thought, you know, uh, oh, don't worry. You know, I, I, I really enjoy working with her. But then I looked up this woman on LinkedIn, and I realized that she's the science correspondent for the San Jose Mercury News, which is basically like our, our Boston Globe. You know, it's our local paper. And uh, then I called her back, and I said, actually, how about we meet for coffee? <laughs> and uh, I, met, I met her, and that turned, you know, of all things, into a cover story about ALD and ALD Connect and uh, my relationship with Keith Van Heeren. And of course, after that, an outpouring of, of, uh, of support, of uh, uh, financial gifts. Um, and so, you know, just a, a, a wonderful way uh, to raise awareness and, and uh, advocate for this, uh, this community. Um, and then, you know, we need to continue to, to partner uh, with uh, the likes of Elisa on, on of course, uh, standard of care uh, for uh, families uh, who have uh, screen positive uh, for ALD. And then finally, uh, one very fun aspect, I think, of the, what we do is international bridge building, uh, working with ILA, uh, working with people uh, who are all over the world, uh, in Korea, in Argentina, um, and Moser talked about Bolivia. I mean, just going to these far-flung places and, uh, and finding patience and, uh, you know, showing solidarity, but, of course, um, uh, helping them uh, as well. And then, uh, you know, very lastly, uh, um, working with other groups. Uh, this is not, you know, a winner-take-all uh, space. Uh, we can all benefit from each other. We can work together uh, to raise awareness uh, with uh, legislators, with regulators, uh, with companies, with funders. And so many of these neurodegeneration, uh, mary, uh, neurodegenerative illnesses share, uh, you know, just a ton of common traits. And so we are, uh, we need to, to, to partner, uh, you know, with, for example, Farah and uh, the, the Batten disease uh, community, and, and many others uh, to, uh, to make more of an impact. And I think, let me see if there is another slide, but I think that's it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. So I think that kind of encapsulated, you know, a lot of the themes we, we talked about today. I would love to, um, uh, to have any reactions, any questions. Uh, before we break for the social. <laughs> There's something you didn't hear about today that you would like to hear about. There's something you're missing, right? I, I always feel um, to get so focused on uh, something Hi. and uh, you might be missing um, topics that are important and relevant. I don't know if, can we hear from some of the women uh, in the room? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, I have a uh, scientific background. I'm an engineer, but I'm not an MD. Um, is there a, like any books or sources that you would recommend where the semi-layman can learn about things like uh, bone marrow transplants and some of this gene therapy um, that looks promising? So, so a, lot, a lot of this is newly evolving information that uh, is probably best found in the websites that we are curating, whether it's that, that uh, um, Stefan Kemp curates in, the, in Amsterdam or, or the ALD Connect website uh, in terms of s staying up to date on, on what's happening. I mean, gene therapy is so, uh, is so new that there are no textbooks as such. 
Uh, I, you know, I hope we can come out with that one day as a gene therapy for dummies or something like that. But, <laughs> um, but, but I, I, I think it's all very, very fresh. And, and so, um, uh, you know, Ben mentioned some of the sources and how he educates himself, and he's been certainly a, a model uh, for, for how to uh, go out and find information and inform himself. I know, Ben, do you want to speak to that? Well, I think, um, you know, these are, these are uh, very, very good issues. So one question, for example, uh, that I got after, um, after the publication of the story is a lot of people came to me and said, you know, you, you, you talk about having ALD in the story, and then there is mention of Bluebird Bio. Are you going to try the Bluebird Bio therapy? And, you know, and then you get in the weeds of, you know, uh, is that therapy, you know, w will it work for adults? You know, is it targeted at the adult uh, phenotype? And then, you know, what are some of the, 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 the risk benefit trade-offs, you know, for that I think totally um, add up, you know, for a, a boy who is in the early but active stage of the disease and whose outlook is very bleak if, if, you know, if the disease is allowed to continue its course versus somebody who was more on a slow, very slow decline like me, you know, who probably could be um, you know, a little bit more reluctant to, to go with some of the, the risks associated with the, uh, that, that protocol. And these are the kinds of nuances you know, that are hard to find on any given website or in any, um, I think, any publication. You have to really kind of dig very deep to understand that. Okay, is there something out there on a NIH website that explains basically how DNA works? Now I understand there's 23 chromosomes and the genes have like 20,000 base pairs on average roughly and we're uh, interested in one that's on the, was it the 23rd chromosome and it's out near the end. And I'd like to just understand more about the basics of genetics, I guess. Maybe if there is such a website out there, can you put a link to it on the ALD Connect website? I know Khan Academy has some videos on, on DNA that are really good very much for high school students. Yeah, and NIH has some information, but it's quite rudimentary. Um, you know, in terms of uh, clinical decision making, a lot of clinicians who might not know about ALD will go to a website called Up to Date, and there are uh, there those pages are also in, put out in layman terms as well. So you can get uh, layman information uh, from, uh, from up to date. When it comes to you know, the basic molecular biology, you know, I'm sure there are a wealth of, of simple texts that would convey what DNA is. And um, you know, uh, I don't know how far you want to go, but Siddhartha Mukherjee's recent book on the gene is, is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I, I would encourage anybody who has some scientific interest to, uh, and may not be in the field, uh, to, to read uh, the book, The Gene. Um, so very engaging and um, a wonderful story. Okay, I think they were, uh, there was a question in the back. I was just going to suggest the TED Talk, Nick Leshley's on um, yes. the gene therapy. Yeah, that's a, that's a and wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful visualization yes. in that yeah. too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think we had. Uh, um, I'm curious, so, so this is our first year here, my husband has ALD, um, and I'm a caregiver, and I've, I've heard you allude to you know, information for caregivers, but I'm wondering if you've ever done or had discussions related to carriers. For example, his mother is a carrier, his sister is a carrier, but they're, I feel like they get a little lost in the mix, a little lost in the shuffle um, of discussions you know, for mental health, emotional health. Um, symptoms they may be going through. Do you ever, has that been a part of your discussions? Yeah, so, so, so we have webinars on, on, uh, on our ALD Connect um, website and, and there are certainly um, um, women carrying the gene who are part of our, our different work groups. There's also information on, on, uh, on Stefan Kemp's curated website, adrenalocadistry.info. Yes, a few pages. Mary, you want to say a little bit about? 
When I was diagnosed 15 years ago, there was no information. My internist sent me to a psychiatrist because I didn't, couldn't walk and she thought I was faking it. My first neurologist said women get symptoms, but men get the disease, get everybody tested at Hopkins. Well, we're just on the verge of getting a great deal of information. ALD Connect has hosted several conference calls for women with symptoms who share them. I highly recommend the AMC article on women, which lays out many of the symptoms women get. But talking to Ali, other patients, and other neurologists, I'm finding we have a broader spectrum. For example, osteoporosis is prevalent. And all of the side effects of that. Kaylee will sometime soon update the ALD Connect with website with a lot of new information. <laughs> and I'd be able to exchange, I've talked to several of you about symptoms and how we each deal. And I, I will add um, w one quick thing on the so out of the article, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, mothers reached out to me who have sons who uh, have passed away or are very sick with the disease. And then uh, at the end of the conversation, I asked, well, how are, are you doing you know, health-wise? And they all had symptoms at, at some level or another. And they all said the same thing, which was very sad. They said, you know, but my symptoms I'm ignoring them because they're nothing compared to my sons. And so I think you have also a psychological dimension that women are, you know, uh, tend to, um, uh, to frankly neglect their, their own health uh, because they're so absorbed in taking care of their, uh, their husbands, their sons. You know. I found exercise very valuable to get back some walking skills and I'll start a more intensive exercise program now that my surgeries are done. But a lot of you are taking drugs for urinary incontinence. Pelvic floor exercises, if you find a good urogynecologist it's something you can do for life, a few, couple, five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Hi, I uh, just had a comment. My name's Bill. My uh, wife's a carrier and I have two boys, well, three boys too with ALD. Um, I just wanted to say there's, there's still a lot of the um, population that doesn't use social media. And so I find myself reposting, retweeting, re-whatevering the information that comes out from a lot of the organizations here. Um, and I encourage some of my family members uh, get a Twitter account, if not just for that reason, or Facebook or whatever it is, because you can reach a lot more people. Um, I retweet something, maybe 10 people see it. My wife does, 3,000 people see it. <laughs> so there's some power in that, because you never know who might be watching or listening or seeing. So I uh, just wanted to encourage people to use those tools. They're pretty powerful. Brian, you want to speak to that, or? I'll just echo the. I'll just uh, echo those sentiments. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of the social media for ALD Connect, and uh, just like uh, Elisa does, and Jean, and other um, uh, other advocacy organizations, and it it can be very very powerful. Um, sometimes it's hit or miss. I don't know if you've experienced that, Bill, but sometimes it, you get an incredible amount of reach 
and sometimes you don't. And so I think it's a function of sharing and uh, people just reposting it. And But uh, it's, it's a powerful tool. say that into the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, people, but I'm really not that popular. <laughs> you are now. Last name is Grohl, G-R-O-E-L. I'm not Billy Joel, I'm Billy Grohl. You might remember that. <laughs> uh, very catchy, very catchy. Yeah, that's <laughs> Other comments? <laughs> Okay, I just had to ask you about this um, stem cell tourism to Asia. Uh, I guess it's a bluff or something like that, but um, can you sort of comment a bit on that? You heard about it? Yeah, okay. No, I understand. So, so I think that I it's, a, it's a, yes, it's, it's a bluff. Maybe that's the right way to say it. So I think, uh, there's a lot of money being made, unfortunately, out of people's hopes for many different diseases with these so-called stem cell clinics. Um, there is many of them in Asia, typically in uh, China or in India and now in Latin America as well. There is a quite big one in Panama with U.S. trained doctors who are Columbia University trained neurosurgeon and so on and so on. So when you look in detail what they're doing, uh, it's it's very hard to know what they're doing. Um, there, is, um, there are some clinics that use mesenchymal stem cells um, that they claim they're using mesenchymal stem cells that came from cord blood of some cord blood, and others say that they use the patient's own stem cells. Others say that they use just stem cells. Uh, some claim that they're using neural stem cells. Um, there's no validation of anything they're doing. Uh, they're not under any regulatory agency in this country. And in most countries that have a regulatory agency, th when these things pop up, they get closed down after a while. Um, so uh, we've been recommending people not to pursue those paths because they have no data. And they can guarantee you that they will cure, and they will also guarantee you that there's no side effect. And you know anybody who has had a patient here in the family who underwent bone marrow transplantation, you know that there's no such thing as not having a side effect when you get cells. And um, there is a couple um, papers out there, publications of human trials that were done in the trial setting. Both were coming from China, uh, where where you know it's, it's coming from an academic institution. They used allogeneic. Uh, you, both are from our cord blood derived cells not in ALD, but in other pediatric neurologic conditions, where they just gave the cells in, as an infusion without the chemotherapy, without the immune ablation and all that. And when you look at those cases, uh, they actually showed in both publications that the cells die off usually within 24 to 48 hours in the peripheral nervous system. Now, they may release some growth factors that may perhaps transiently be doing something, but certainly uh, there's no data at all, and even I would go a step further and say there's no rationale, for instance, why these things would work for at least most of the phenotypes of ALD that, that currently are not treatable, you know, like the AMN and females and advanced cerebral ALD. So, yeah, it's, it's a scam. That's the bottom line. But this comes back maybe to Ben's point that you know maybe there there would be a role within the ALD community for something like ALS Untangled, where you know there's there's a brief review of what is out there and and uh, you know those of us who are in the field of stem cells um, you know, know how trials are conducted and what regulatory oversight is needed and what is lacking and not said in some of these um, other sites. So I, I think that's a good point, point to, um, to la add to our list of things to do next year. Sorry to bother you once again. <laughs> I just want to know, Steve just made 18, which he was supposed to make eight years old. Um, what can I do, like, 
what can I do for my son's whatever time he got left? Like, could you guys do a study on, you know, to find out what's keeping him going? Because we don't know. And he hasn't had a CAT scan since the day he was diagnosed 11 years ago. And they told me he wasn't going to make eight years old. Yeah, so, so, so I think it's actually a very important topic. And let's see uh, Dr. Hoon walk out. So on, I'm very, I'm very happy. Sorry, stay, I, I didn't want to stop you, but. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ha, <laughs> just big, big credit to having a trial in advanced cerebral ALD, okay? I think that, that I, I, I want to applaud the fact that we're actually, some companies are starting to tackle that space. We have not done enough in terms of understanding outcome measures within the advanced cerebral ALD space, I'm going to argue. So um, I think a lot of what we know is the art of medicine and clinical practice and experience. Um, um, but, but we do not have uh, you know, solid data to support uh, uh, notions of what uh, improves function um, or, or, or survival apart from sort of the um, medical management and you know g2 placement of avoiding complications things like that so i think we need more i i got a question give me one second uh we've kind of a lot of the presentations have have touched on this a little bit and at least raised the question in my mind i'm curious if Yourself, Dr. Eichler, and the larger ALD research community, if we've made any progress in terms of developing even like a hunch of the diversity within the phenotypic expressions within ALD, it kills young boys, and there's Ben Linnell. You know, so there's such a diversity in terms of how, and I'm, you know, I remember that we had conversations about this last year. And I know that Josh Bonkowski and Bluebird Bio are putting together plans for some kind of study on that. I'm curious if there's been any kind of progress in terms of saying, you know, here's maybe what's going on with why it affects some people this way and others in another way. So um, the. Uh the study you're mentioning is, is something that we're, um, uh, at Bluebird, we're sort of the epicenter of it. Yeah. But uh, what, what's underway is we're uh, collaborating with uh, academic partners, with uh, Florian. Um, we have a material transfer agreements with other institutions, basically to collect as many DNA samples and as much um, clinical information that we can from uh, boys who um, have the cerebral disease and then uh, men, and then uh, some uh, men with the adult cerebral form. So all of this is de-identified information, and it's all collected under you know, IRB-approved uh, protocols. So, um, and then last week I presented uh, in, in Philadelphia a, an early look at those data, and what we'd love to do is um, you, you know, look at, at, um, at the genomes of everyone in the study, compare them to all of those different clinical presentations, and see if we can find some correlations. See if we can find some genes that may confer some, you know, something that would tilt uh, a child in one direction or another. And so right now we have only a small number of samples, but we have a lot of excitement around that, sam of that, around that study, and so it's, that cohort is growing. And so. Oh, definitely. So, so what we're looking for here, it, it may not be um, something that that exists, but it, it, uh, it this is filling in the blank for uh, a large-scale genetic study, which which isn't you know currently published. So we don't know if we'll find something, but it's um, it's an effort underway to uh, to fill in that blank. Set of you know where you collect the information about the symptoms that the person is showing, 
and you can match that against their specific genetics. I mean, I know the database you talked about, right? Is that the one? No. No. no the, uh, because it's. Oh, sorry. Um, the the well uh, the ODA database is is just collecting uh, genetic information. It's completely de-identified. Uh, you can hack the site. Uh, what what what's underneath the site is what you see on the site. So it's uh, so no there, and we specifically stayed away from from uh, phenotypic information because there, the 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 the, the, the genome the genetic information wi within the ALD gene doesn't help you. In, in pre uh, predicting the, the, the outcome, but but Neurobank uh, is is that platform that that's completely secured, safe uh, behind uh, large walls, and uh, so that that's what that information will be. Yeah, and yeah, so Neurobank is 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 the platform that we use to um, where that uh, clinical sites enter data. In there's also a patient portal that uh, you can sign up on and, um, and use um, surveys to tell us what is important to you in terms of resources, in terms of um, research. And there's, some, there's a tool called NeuroTracker. And why I mention this is it gives you the ability to track your own functional uh, abilities over time. And every time you complete a survey at any given time point, you can print out a summary. And our goal is to, as, as enough people aggregate in this patient portal, that there will be an ability to see a, a de-identified aggregate where you will be able to maybe say, well, how am I doing compared to others in my age group, in my gender? So I think these are some of the aspirations that we know we have the technical tools for. It's a question of can we also galvanize and get the momentum and motivation from the community to, to use them and, and make them richer and more valuable through using them. So I actually have a question from somebody who is watching the live stream. Um, so their question is how someone can push for a drug to be approved for a compassionate access. Um, it's difficult since there are no treatments available for people with advanced ALD symptoms and they want to know how they could go about that. Ali, should I? Okay. Okay, so, so compassionate use. Um, uh, re requires you to engage with a physician at an uh, in, at an institution, where the institutional review board will review this on a case by case basis, um, and uh, and and certainly uh, the important part is here weighing risk and benefit um, of of any intervention and drug, and these are very difficult um, uh, decisions. Because um, what a drug that might might have shown promise in in a healthier person might have adverse effects in somebody who has disease at more advanced uh, stages, and so I think one one of the challenges we face is when we are trying to learn from the experience from others, right? So we are constantly listening to our peers and finding out what works and doesn't work. And then the question is, how can I then apply that to myself or my child? And, and, um, and the, 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 the challenge is, is that my child might be at a very different stage than what worked for somebody else. That having been said, I think um, if you do this uh, with a trusted uh, physician, who can help you understand and monitor and weigh risk and benefit, and this can be put into, uh, um, you know, can be brought to the IRB and importantly also brought to uh, the FDA in terms of uh, an IND um, application for compassionate use. This can be done. Um, we've we've approached this in with various other drugs in patients with advanced disease. Um, it's not easy, I, that's all I'm going to say. I don't know if others want to comment. Could I just add to that that um, you know, we've had personal experience with that process and it worked marvelously well for us. We were able to gain access 
to a drug that was in clinical trial uh, for our son uh, when he was in his final days. Uh, what I'd add, too, is when you go to the FDA, the physician that you're working with also goes to the drug company because somebody's going to have to provide the drug, right? And you can't just get it off the shelf. And the FDA approves virtually 100% of all those uh, requests because they trust the clinician and, and um, you know, the, the process of the IRB. They always work together. So it's not the FDA that's slowing this process down. In the cases when a patient does not gain access, it is almost 100% of the time the, the company that says uh, we will not provide the drug for various reasons. Either we think it would, uh, it would diminish the prospects for the clinical trial that's going on, because if everybody gained um, you know, expanded access, nobody would participate in the trial. Or we don't have enough drug for everybody. We, we, we need to use the drug we've got to make sure this drug works. Let's make sure it works in this patient population. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about, about this attempt to use the right to try uh, on a federal basis that some states have adopted. It, all that does is circ circumnavigate the, an attempt to circumnavigate the FDA and doesn't make any difference. The FDA is not the, not the obstacle here. So. Good, good point, Ron. Other questions? So I think we've had a very full day, and we've reached 5 o'clock, and I, again, want to thank everybody for the engaging discussions and talks, and we'll have more of that uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I, uh, a round of applause to everyone. So. <laughs>